Hey, welcome back to us and episode two, Laura, which remarkably is about episode two of season three, two by two. There's a lot of twos in what I just said then. Yep. Let me move on from twos and to you. So we are going to talk about this episode and I think in particular we're going to gravitate more towards the second half because way more happens in the second half. And there is a centerpiece in this episode that will be awesome to talk with you about because I think... If you watch this episode and talk to anyone about the episode, surely you talk about this moment and then something that happens just after. But before we get to the back half, Laura, the first half of episode two, season yeah. three, two by two, anything stand out to you? Well, as expected, this episode really picks up well from the previous episode where... Funnily enough. in Yes, previously on The Chosen, <laughs> we saw that Matthew was having some issues with his family, right? How he, how he sat with them as a son or not. Because of his That's a polite way of describing how his parents basically said you're dead to us. I mean, basically, yeah. But then in this episode, there's the sort of uh, reconciliation, a moment of reconciliation between the two that wasn't just about... What stood out to me about it was that it wasn't just related to, hey, I did something wrong, forgive me. But it was actually about insights into Jesus' teaching on Matthew's part that made him realize, oh, some of my behaviors maybe haven't been what they should have been. I want to apologize for that. I want to address that. And then on his parents' side, particularly for his dad, his dad says, hang on, you know, you're not the only one who's done wrong in this situation. I've now seen through Jesus' teaching that I should be addressing this and this and this. And so they kind of make amends with each other, not just because as a father and son, they've wanted to reconcile, but because they've both realized that there's a different way of living they want to adhere to. And that's come through the teachings of Jesus, which I found is a really, you know, it's a really good way to set up the episode because it shows something we were touching on a little bit last time, the way that if you're following Jesus, if you're listening to Jesus, there are going to be things in your own life that you start to realize you want to adjust and you want to change. And what I really appreciate about the way the chosen depicts the disciples is that they do take active steps to make a change. You know, what they actually hear does legitimately change their actions it's not just ideas that they talk about around the next you know dinner table there's a real sense that each of them want to follow jesus and really take his teachings to heart and we're going to talk more about that as we get to what happens in the middle of this episode but before we do i like this exchange between matthew and his dad i thought that was the strongest pretty much in the first half of the episode one of the things i like about it is how it demonstrates not only forgiveness and the power of forgiveness and what the process you go through, but also how forgiveness doesn't equal that you forget about everything or it doesn't make everything right, particularly for the dad who says, yes, all of these things happen because of your actions to our family. However, Mm. I contributed to this situation as well. And also I'm not above asking you for forgiveness, even though you're asking me for forgiveness. It's not a competition. It's a recognition that because of the teaching that the dad also heard from Jesus, it is shaping his life, not just the mm. disciples now. It's permeating out, which is why more and more people are starting to come and seek out Jesus. What did you make of the fact that the crowds are building up now? And I thought the city is called Capernaum, mm. but I think in the episode they call it Capernaum. And I don't know if that's like an Americanized thing <laughs> or a universal accent on a TV show yeah. thing, or am I just wrong with my pronunciation? Capernaum as well? I, there you go. So yep. that city, right? They're so. in that city at the moment. <laughs> and there's people all building up and they're coming to see Jesus and that sort of stuff. And like, I get why they're showing that in The Chosen. But for me, mm. a lot of this first half of this episode shows how comfortable a TV show's got in a good way. So you're getting into those rhythms of a long season, long format show mm. where they're building up all these threads. Yeah. And there's a lot of that exposition that often we can roll our eyes at in a movie particularly where you just feel like someone like I'm doing now is explaining to you what's happening and this is the bit and it's like a bridge to get from here to here Mm. and that's the only reason this exists is to explain why we're going to end up on that side. I found a lot of the scenes like that, including with the crowds, but then there's also all these trace elements of what I know is going to come later on Mm. and I think I was still engaged I think I was up until this moment, which we're definitely going to get to. But what about you? I I was definitely there. I was engrossed, but it felt for me like 
you're building something here, not necessarily giving me something amazing, apart from maybe the Matthew mm. and the father scene. Well, and I think it is a moment in the episode where it's kind of like, it is to a degree like the filler between part A, part B type of thing. <laughs> but there's not... Filler's a bit harsh though, isn't it? No, like, it's, well, because what I was going to say is it's not necessarily totally empty. Like, it's like, yes, you can see that you're using this to get from there to there, but it's not empty of intention because through those times where you see the crowds gathering, where you're seeing the soldiers start to chat back and forth about who is this Jesus guy? More people are paying attention to him. What's he really teaching? How does it contradict what our rulers say? And they're, and even at one point they're talking about, well, how can we monetize this thing? Like if it's going to be something happening in our city, how can we get, you know, tax dollars from it and make it benefit, you know, us in that way? There's, yes, that's something that may not be the most gripping part of the story, but I think it's a really important part that shows as it would have been in Jesus' day, the word of his existence and the possibility of him being the Messiah or maybe not would have started to kind of spread through people. And also the fact that he was, you know, doing miracles and people were starting to hear that he's changing people's lives and the disciples are starting to get a reputation in their own right for being the people that are following this guy. And what are they saying? I think there's something to that because in the same way that all of us have our own experience in when we first heard about Jesus and what we think of him, people at that day had the same thing. Like you've heard this rumor of this guy, what's he really talking about? Does it apply to me? Is it something that's gonna matter in my life? Including the impact on people who may or may not end up following him. And the Romans are a really good example of that. And I do like a bit of Quintus and a bit of Gaius and all that getting together and talking about how yeah. Rome is gonna deal with this little uprising that we know from history changes the face of the entire world but watching people try to wrestle with this on an everyday basis is one of the best things about the chosen isn't it and yes as much as the first half for me filler is definitely too strong like i think i was heading in that direction almost of suggesting it was it's not mm. but i do like how across the series we keep going into all these different avenues of the world that jesus inhabited in the first century and all the different ways that he impacted people yeah and imagining what that might have been like and it's great that the chosen's up front about this isn't actually the bible loads mm. of stuff is derived directly from but they're taking it as a launching off pad yeah. to work out how can we better dump all of us now into that world mm. and see if we can try to experience this for ourselves yeah um, what did you make of so there's Simon and Eden? They get a bit more involved about like where their relationships at and yeah. their their link with Jesus and their service with Jesus. How are you tracking with that? Well, I think that's an important bit to mention as well. In this, in like, like what you've said, this story, this series is not trying to match everything that Scripture says exactly. It's trying to flesh out the lives of the disciples. And it's important to have those moments of exchange between characters like Simon and Eden to see the parts of the disciples' lives and the followers of Jesus that weren't all about, you know, the mission. Like, yes, they're on mission and yes, their intention is to be following Jesus. But like all of us, they do have all of these other parts of life that have to fit around that part, you know. And so as a couple, they do have a marriage relationship to attend to, to talk about, to think through alongside the actual day-to-day -day things they have to do, whether it's working, whether it is following Jesus, whether it's traveling, you know, there are there's still two humans there relating to each other and they've got to talk that through. And, and even, that amazing conversation they had where Eden talks about forgetting the face of Jesus, even yes, though she saw yeah. him, what, like a few weeks before. Right, that's what I was going to bring up because her saying that I think speaks to what many of us can experience. And I, there is a scripture that mentions this, you know, you don't want to forget the face of Jesus, right? Like looking in a mirror and forgetting your reflection. Oh, yes, yeah, like in you, one of the letters towards, towards the end, it's, you know, somewhere towards the back in the New Testament, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I think in putting that into the script for Eden, it it does kind mm. of say encountering Jesus once isn't really enough. Like, yes, of course, being exposed to Jesus in person would have had a huge impact on Eden and on all of the others that had that. But a relationship with Jesus following him isn't just about one moment and one, you know, kind of insight. It's actually about this continuous connection, continuous communication, which just that moment from her, I thought really spoke to. Yeah. And I like how the chosen steadily is revealing to us uh, for those of us who have never seen Jesus you and I have never seen Jesus everybody else alive has never seen Jesus we're watching people who though do get to meet and interact with Jesus and even they as you could re reasonably imagine although I've never stopped to actually do this that you met Jesus and then he left mm. you might have struggled at that point for like oh what did he exactly say and what did he look yeah. like and what did he do the challenge for them let alone the challenge for us to live that out 
Uh, as we get to this moment, Laura, and we've, we've, we get, we're building up this episode basically the same way The Chosen episode does, where we're eventually going to get to the bit. But before we definitely get to the bit, so the build-up to the bit mm. where, spoiler alert, Jesus sends out his disciples. But in and around that, Laura, I am actually, I am liking how we're getting this stronger sense of all the different ways Jesus is affecting people mm, and all yeah. the and and you get this uh you, you your mind starts to wonder about how these threads are all going to start converging such as simon the zealot and some and that roman spy guy who yeah. has a lot of lines that basically are dropped from like tv shows in the past 20 years it's a bit <laughs> of an anachronism but i quite like him but he's he talks in that way of like for real and um we'll, our people will reach out to you he says that kind of stuff i'm like really in the first century mm. sure but that kind of interaction you um uh, you start to wonder how that's all going to explode yeah. later on. But you safely presume that's not going to in this episode. But what does... Now, here we are, Laura, mm. at the bit where we're finally going to talk about the bit. This amazing scene where Jesus sends out his disciples. Have you yeah. ever thought about... And I know it's in the Bible. It's like Matthew 10 or something, and mm. it's quite a lengthy description of it. But have you ever sat back and thought, what might that have been like? I don't think in practical terms, right? Like I've always just read it as, you know, Jesus yeah. sent them out and then they had this job to do and they went there. And Even know, though it was a massive job to do, like go and cast out spirits and heal well, and, and preach my word and do it in the face of persecution. Yeah, but and even just the actual land that they were covering, like particularly as someone living in Australia, reading the Bible, all of these places that aren't like that seem just as imaginary as everything else right like until <laughs> yeah, you actually yeah. learn your geography and understand the places you don't have a tangible concept of what life looked like where they were really going what was that distance really like that these disciples had had charged to cover you know and i like what the this episode does in dealing with some of the things the questions that does that, that, that the disciples had like how are we going to get food who's going to look after us what do we do if people don't accept us in their town because jesus was talking about you know if someone doesn't want to hear what you have to say just carry on like you know shake the dust off your feet and go to the next place and then for the disciples to come back with questions about who's going to manage the resource that does come in and who's the best person for that and even in the context of the way the characters are represented in the chosen like matthew the tax collector he's like i don't want to you know go back to managing money like that was obviously something that was a challenge and a weak spot for him mm, he didn't want and to be then, tempted by it again no. i really liked that inclusion in the episode yeah. and then that judas is the one they appoint to manage it and you and i found that really interesting because obviously they've written that in as an aside to what scripture gives us yes but it kind of also speaks to what we were talking about last episode of you know, how does someone who was with Jesus, who was face to face with Jesus, eventually end up betraying him? And the way that they've characterized Judas in The Chosen, you kind of go, okay, so we know eventually Judas gives up Jesus for his bag of money. So in that scene, when they're sending them out, you're starting to realize, oh, there's like a bit of a seed here where money is clearly like a potential source of temptation for Judas already now. Like, because his first question was about, how do we, you know, I've thought of ways for us to monetize this and get money more effectively, which in and of itself, not a bad thing, but it's just these little things where it goes, all right, this is an area that maybe you don't fully trust God or you're going to have potential weakness here. And then it's like he's appointed into that role. And I feel like that gave us another layer to Judas to understand why eventually money is going to be the thing that causes him to sort of contradict his own values and the love for, the, for Jesus that he would have no doubt cultivated through following him yeah and even though there's 12 disciples i'm just about to forget how many disciples there are <laughs> even though there's 12 and they're in a room with jesus and jesus jonathan Rumi does such a great job again of getting the the kind of the even the smoothness of jesus but also the substance of jesus and he delivers things in a very direct and to the point way but yeah. with a lot of compassion at the same time even in amongst all that and you get this room full of blokes going what is it what are you talking about and why are you doing this now and how on earth can we possibly do that? You actually somehow in the space of maybe five or ten minutes, I think the sequence goes for, mm. you get a snapshot of pretty much all the disciples and all their varying reactions to it. And yeah. Judas and Matthew is just one interaction. But around the table, you get this range of reactions, which again, the Bible doesn't give us. Mm. And so like you, when I read it, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see it. like this. I, I'm more focusing on the words of Jesus not the impact it might have had on those who were hearing it, yeah. those being sent out, those given by Jesus the power to do what he is doing, that they've mm -hmm. seen him do it, 
But then I like there's a note in there about um, not feeling any difference. I can't remember which disciple yeah. says it, but like, Jesus, you've got to be joking. Like, is this the ceremony where we get sent out? If it is, well, I don't feel any difference. And then Jesus just comes back nicely with, it's not about how you feel. I'm of authorizing you to go forth and do this. Yeah, yeah. You don't need to actually feel any different, which the, the two of the really big things in that uh, exchange, I think, is that part about whether you're qualified or not, right? Like you don't, there doesn't need to be anything spectacular for you to be able to sort of walk in step with what Jesus wants you to do. Like at one point when they're saying like, like that thing of, is there meant to be a ceremony? Like there's this sense that this stuff should all have fanfare and mm. we should all be somehow like, I imagine, you know, a moment where like they're knighted or something <laughs> and sent out. Like I was imagining ticker tape parade or streamers yeah, or like, something, but knighted. Sure. Or some like great, you know, <laughs> laying on of hands in this exchange or something like yes. it's, it's, it's our ability for to be Christ-like to, you know, do the things on earth that mirror him and that, you know, draw people closer to him they don't have to come with fanfare and some you know whole thing it actually can just be like you've been in my presence i've given you this authority now just go do it and yes. you can see the disciples wrestle with the simplicity of that but then also it kind of i don't know what made me think about it this way this time as opposed to any other time i've heard this story but just the fact that it was two by two like when when jesus says okay for this mission i'm going to need you to all go out we're like spreading the word he could have reached double the population by sending them out individually. Like you've got 12, oh, yeah. disi 12 yes. disciples. Yes. They could have gone to 12 different, you know, yep. far flung parts of the world. But he's like, no, go together, which halves the amount of places they're going to go. But it's significant that there's two by two, right? So it's like you, that kind of speaks in some way to the fact that in the way we follow Jesus, we don't do it alone. Like you need to have companionship. You need to have someone with you as you're going out spreading a message, which on a real practical level, I think it's so you've got someone to check, you know, what you're saying, right? Like if you're going to do this grand moment, there's someone going, hey, like keeping you in line. Yeah, you know? yeah. Is that you, really what Jesus said? And you said? definitely get a sense of that right now in The Chosen because the disciples are quite rightly going, this has sort of come out of nowhere. Jesus, yeah. like you've been doing, you've been the one teaching and healing. And now us as the followers, it's like you've sat us down, you brought us here for this meeting. Mm. Now you're going out and you're doing the same yeah. things. No wonder they would need at least one other person it's, to check. Am I, am I doing this right? Yeah, it's like accountability, companionship, support, you know. And I thought that to me really speaks to the heart of Jesus that all along and even in the way that at times in the Bible, he's like, I've done this great miracle, but don't tell anyone. Like he wasn't about this giant takeover and getting famous and everyone knowing who he was. And it wasn't ever about like self aggrandizement. It was always about how is my message going to impact a person? How is it going to draw them closer to God? And what is the most healthy way for my disciples, for my followers to go about doing that? Like it, I just feel like that really speaks to the heart of Jesus, not just the bigger picture of what he's trying to achieve by having come to earth in the first place. What just spoke to my heart, Laura, is you just used self-aggrandizement in a <laughs> sentence. Well played. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank I'm you. going to try to get that into yeah. a sentence in like the next week or so. That's fantastic. Um, we need now to, uh, I think, move on from this central piece of the episode, yeah. which is so worth waiting for. And if people are struggling with the first half, which maybe they will, maybe they won't, but it's worth getting there for that, which is really setting up the rest of this season for The Chosen. But beyond that, I know you were very impacted by, I think it's the immediate scene afterwards where little james one of the disciples comes to jesus and asks some very 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 pointed questions mm. of jesus about what he's been charged to do but why him in particular and what that means for him personally yeah because little james character he has a physical disability which the actual actor jordan walker ross has his he has physical limitations and so there's this, this exchange between jesus and the character of little james where little james is asking how can i heal you know like in simple terms it's like i'm broken how am i going to help people heal from their brokenness when my own hasn't been healed in a way that i might expect yeah like how and could a unhealed person heal someone else unhealed how could that yeah. even be possible and it's such a huge question because as christians in the way we share our faith and even in our own experience of it one of the most difficult things you're ever going to wrestle with is why isn't my circumstance lining up with my expectations of how god should be changing it 
you know, and if that's someone who's in an experience of grief or if they've got some kind of physical ailment that they're praying for God to heal, it is always a really difficult conversation to have when you're saying, why isn't this happening how I think it should? How come, you know? And then here, little James gets to have that conversation with God in person, Jesus, and standing face to face with Jesus, Hmm. asking, why am I not healed? Like, why have you who can heal? I've seen you do it Mm. many times for other people. Why have you not healed me? Yeah. One of your chosen followers. Yeah. And there's a way Jesus responds to that, that does so gently speak to our, um, I think the way we limit what healing looks like, because Jesus says in, again, simplifying it, it's like, this may not happen for you now, but it will happen for you in a way down the line. And the fact that it hasn't happened for you now isn't actually something that holds you back from sharing and healing and you know doing my work with other people. In fact, it may amplify it, but I kind of looked at that as well as the way like we do, because in that exchange, I actually think that Jesus was bringing a deep healing to little James, not necessarily oh, physically. Well, because it's not necessarily physically, but he's actually healing that part of him that says, I'm somehow less than because of this condition, mm, right? Mm, I'm somehow yep. unable because of this condition. And Jesus is sort of saying, you're not unable in any way, you know? And I think that that is a healing in and of itself. It's just not the healing that looks like what you want little James to have had. And the actor Jordan, I spoke to him about this role and he has such a beautiful perspective on it because a lot of fans of the show say to him, you know, when's your character going to get healed? Like expecting it, that's how the story is going to go. And they don't realize that he, the disability he has in the show is his in real life. So he kind of has to say to them like, well, like if Jesus doesn't heal me, like uh, this is me guys, like this is how it is. It's so important uh, to see representation in in pop culture and uh, in faith-based projects in particular, I think that it's having a a disabled character that doesn't get healed is is so unique because normally if if you're watching a a movie or a show about Jesus, if there's a character with a disability, they're going to be healed at some point. Um, And I've had a lot of fans reach out and say things like, oh, I can't wait until little James gets healed. I'm like, well, you may be waiting for a while um, because in order for little James to be healed, I would also have to be healed. And I'm not counting anything out, but I'm also not expecting it. And that's okay because not everyone gets healed. And I think that the relationship between faith and healing is so interesting. And uh, I think what The Chosen is doing with that is is challenging people's uh, ideas of, of what it means to be healed. And he's really used it as a way to have conversations. He actually has his own podcast called, called What's My Limp or What's Your Limp? <laughs> really? And it talks about That's the thing. Good. It's great, but it talks about those things we think can hold us back, but actually how they can be avenues for God's healing, for God's goodness to be shown in our lives just in different ways than we might expect. It's a pretty powerful moment in The Chosen for demonstrating loads of stuff, including how God's strength works through our weaknesses. And you're right, our, what our concept of healing actually is. And it's easy for me to say, as someone who doesn't have the sort of physical or mental limitations that some other people do, I don't have the same sort of health concerns that other people do. So it's easy for me to say. But watching a scene like that, I think as you're talking about, I think you're right. It can It's meant to um, blow the lid off anyone's conception of healing and what it actually means to be healed yeah. by God through Jesus, mm. whether that's now, whether that's into eternity, whatever that looks like. Yeah. But it's got to be surely somewhere anchored in our relationship with God and then f- and then flows out through yeah. from, from that starting point, which mm. I think that sequence, of, it's like four or five minutes yeah. or something, but could do could make a massive difference Mm. in somebody's life and their understanding of healing. Yeah, and also our perception of wholeness. Because I think so much of what we think is whole or ideal or perfect is so conditioned and influenced by culture. And I think it's important to remember that what Jesus sees as whole and what is a eternal picture of wholeness isn't necessarily what we see culture would say it was right like there's actually nothing broken about a person that has a physical ailment there is nothing broken about a person that has a medical condition right they are still a whole individual yes there is a physical ailment there but i think that can be something cultural that we put on saying there's something that is less than here but i think what that scene does in the chosen 
through what Jesus says to little James is that that isn't actually something that speaks of, of limitation or brokenness. There's still a wholeness there, which I thought was, you know, there's just so much in that scene that I just go, this is going to matter so much to so many people. And one of the other great things about The Chosen is it also, that sequence raises possibly more questions than it tries to answer. Like it goes quite close to giving you some big theological concepts to wrestle with, but it doesn't necessarily prescribe exactly how it's all going to play out. Yeah. As we wrap up, Laura, on episode two, the final moments of the episode have the disciples coming together a bit like a band of brothers and they have this big powwow about they're about to be sent out. And we've had some moments before that of a bit of discussion before about what that's going to look like, but they have a very quick discussion. And in short, they're terrified about what is about to happen and where they're going to go. And even though Jesus has empowered them to go, they're still, they're still uh, like, as you'd imagine, just fearful yeah. about what's going to happen. But they get together and almost like a sport team with a, a song for their team. Mm. They together recite, I think it's Psalm 3. I think I searched online real quick after watching the episode. I think it's Psalm 3, a Psalm of David. It's about when Absalom is chasing him. What did you make of them using God's word at the end as a rallying cry, mm. having been empowered by the word of God in the flesh? To go forth spreading the word. See all the word stuff I did there? Beautiful. You're but welcome. It, it, Self-aggrandizement, I believe. There you I just go. En- en- ended and you put on it there. in a sentence. Thank well you. Done. But, but it, getting back to you. It is kind of bizarre though, right? To think that these disciples were kind of freaked out about what God was charging them to do, but also had this awareness of it's all that he's taught us. It is scripture that's going to fuel our ability to accomplish it. And to us living now in you know the modern day context we have the luxury of having scripture to refer back to like we see the whole picture of scripture we've got it all tangibly there the disciples didn't have that Mm. their their lives are written for our benefit but they didn't know where the story was going to go they they had god's word so deeply in them they could recite it like a sport team yeah and it is something that rallies everybody together like i think you see the the beauty of the bonding the way you know scripture is a bonding experience as well as something that personally solidifies and anchors us to then go and do everything that's going to come down the line and like the overarching question of this season of the chosen that we've spoken about is what does it cost to follow jesus like you've said yes now what's that going to mean and i think that kind of moment that scene really points to the fact that okay what what does it involve to follow jesus it actually involves trusting in the truth of the scriptures that he's given us given them up until that point to be able to actually live by there is a huge, we should have touched on this, but we've pretty much touched on everything. So we'd be, we better wind up. But there's a big undercurrent of trust that comes out of that sequence of Jesus sending out the disciples and then their immediate reactions thereafter. Trusting in Jesus mm. is enormous and yet not really strongly stated. Yeah. But it's going to, I imagine, come forward more and more. It's going to come to the fore more and might be more explicitly dealt with. Laura, I think we did it. We did it. I'm pretty sure that's everything you could ever say <laughs> about episode two of season three of um, The Chosen. Maybe, maybe not, but we've done at least a little bit. Yeah, or you might have more things to say. And maybe we didn't cover off things. Maybe you have questions. Maybe you disagree with us entirely. Whatever it is, we would love for you to get in touch. So get in touch with us here. It's down here, isn't it? It's down Where here. people get in touch, like down through here. Yeah. Let us know. We would love to get back to you on future episodes. And we will be back next time, Laura, for... Season, season three. It episode is season three. three. Episode three. Yeah. It should, my math's not so much. <laughs> it's counting fingers. Episode three, season three, as we keep following the chosen. Mm-hmm.